welcome to Libraries Today. This program is intended to recognize and highlight the unexpected ways local libraries serve their communities today. I'm your host, Stan Howe. Each year, thousands of elementary, middle school, and high school students from all across the country take part in Letters About Literature. Letters About Literature is a national reading and writing program which asks students to read a book, poem, or play, and then write a letter to the author, living or dead, describing how that author's work affected their life. For the 25th consecutive year, the program has been sponsored by the West Virginia Library Commission and the West Virginia Center for the Book. This year, 678 West Virginia students took part in Letters About Literature, and 62 of those were honored with top honors, honors, honorable mention, and notable mention recognition. Nationally, more than 40,000 students participated. It works like this. Students are divided into three age categories. Level 1, grades 4 through 6, Level 2, grades 7 and 8, and Level 3, grades 9 through 12. Entries are first sent to the Library of Congress in Washington to be read by national judges. Those national judges then send the best of the state's letters to local West Virginia judges, who then determine the statewide winners. West Virginia's winners were honored at ceremonies at the Culture Center on State Capitol grounds in May, and they were welcomed by the Executive Secretary of the Library Commission, Karen Goff. So welcome to the annual Letters About Literature Awards Ceremony. I'm Karen Goff, Executive Director of the West Virginia Library Commission and number one fan of Letters About Literature. This is the premier activity of the West Virginia Center for the Book, a program that is proudly hosted by the Library Commission. And the mission of the center is to celebrate books, reading, and a rich literary heritage of West Virginia. This year, 678 West Virginia students joined more than 40,000 students nationwide in submitting Letters About Literature entries. Of those 678, national screeners selected 62 for state level judging. This is a lower number, the, the numbers that were sent back, and I think the, um, I don't know what happened, the national screeners must have got really, really picky. So these numbers are important because they highlight the fact that by being the writer of one of those 62 letters, you are in a very distinguished group. Now, over the years, we have had people say, oh, well, I got notable mention. That's not very good. It is very good. It's a really big deal, believe me. Think about it. Only one of every 10 West Virginia entries was selected for state level judging and you're in that group. Now, I tried to do the math the other way. I mean, the whole ratio thing, one in, so one in 10 was easy. Um, but what is 62 out of 40,000? Think of that, that, that is that time. It is much less than 1% because there kept being zeros on it. And I wanted to translate it into something else and didn't quite get the math right. But you're in a really, really very distinguished group. Um, it's an achievement that each of you, your families, and your teachers can be very proud of. Now at each judging level, your letter was read at least twice. So when you sent your letter in to wherever it goes now, it used to go to Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania. I think it goes to a different place now. But those national screeners read it at least twice. And I have a feeling they read it more than that. At each reading, the important evaluation factor is how well the letter answered the question, what changed for me because I read this book? That's a whole different question than you usually get 
which is, you know, to write a report. What is this book about? Answering what changed in me because of this book takes courage to answer it. And each one of you here today accepted that challenge. In doing so, you answered the question also, why read? Now, Stephen King calls books uniquely portable magic. Isn't that a, I, I like that term. Maya Angelou says any book that helps a child to form a habit of reading, to make reading one of his deep and continuing needs, is good for him. Any book that makes him want to, a child want to read more, is good. And I agree that whether it's the Pokey Pokey Puppy, and when my daughter was little, I read the Pokey Pokey Puppy over and over and over again. And then she moved on to, once upon a time, there was a sweet and pretty girl named Cinderella. <laughs> and I read, I, I think we wore out two little gold books of Cinderella. I think she was aiming for the role. She never quite made it. And then ne Neil Gaiman says, a book is a dream you hold in your hand. I like that almost as much as uniquely portable magic. But because all of you wrote about how reading leaves you better, leaves you different, it is not difficult to recruit our state level judges. This year the judges were Dr. Sylvia Sherbet. She's a professor of English and director of the Appalachian Heritage Writer in Residence Project at Shepherd University. Eva McGuire, director of the Craft Memorial Public Library in Bluefield. Timothy Huguenin, West Virginia author of Little One and When the Watcher Shakes. This is Appalachian Horror. Now, I have never read Appalachian Horror. It sounds interesting, and I'm going to have to try it. And Bonnie Dwyer, a specialist at the Morgantown Public Library, was also one of our judges, and she is here today. Welcome, Bonnie. We're glad to have you here. Now, the judges always express admiration for your writing, and they always find choosing winners very, very difficult. And not surprisingly, they don't always agree. So we have to work that out. Now, the West Virginia Humanities Council is the Library Commission's partner in the West Virginia Center for the Book. And the Humanities Council provides the monetary awards for Letters About Literature winners, for the top honors and honor winners. So we are always very, very glad to see Mark Payne, program officer at the council, arrive with a pocket full of, this year, golden envelopes. Now in those golden envelopes, for those of you who are top winners, or top honors and honors, there is cash. If you lose it, it is irreplaceable, <laughs> non-refundable. So it, when you have your, if you get a golden envelope, hang on to it or give it to some semi-responsible adult to hang on for you. And it, because if they lose it, then you could say, well, you lost my money. And they have to pay up for you. Humanities Council, not so much, <laughs> you know, they, but we're really glad that they do that for us. Um, we're also very pleased to have Andrea Lemon, who is the English Language Arts Coordinator at the West Virginia Department of Education here with us today. And Andrea, I am sorry I did not get to speak to you before the, servi the service, the ceremony, um, we were sort of agonizing over our missing speaker, <laughs> but we're very glad to have you here. Andrea is representing Clayton Birch, who's Interim Secretary of Education and the Arts, and he sends you all his congratulations. The 2018 ceremonies recognize the state's top winners in each category. Paisley Tabor of Hurricane Middle School for Level 1, Marley Johns of the Lindsley School in Wheeling for Level 2, and Kayla Strickland of Roan County High School in Spencer for Level 3. When we return, we'll hear from some of these remarkable students. We'll be back after this. In 
In today's program, we're going to hear from a few of the students themselves as they read their award-winning letters. Paisley Tabor is a sixth grader from Hurricane Middle School, and she won top honors for her letter to Malala Yousafzai for the book, I Am Malala. Your book, I Am Malala, has inspired me and truly changed my life for the better. I have always been in biographies, especially autobiographies. So, as you can imagine, when I saw your book, I didn't hesitate to pick it up. As I started reading the book, my mind was set into a different perspective, how I saw the world. This book has been my wake-up call. I started appreciating things that I've taken for granted for as long as I can remember. You showed me a new path in life. As a girl who loves school, I could not imagine not being able to go. Despite what you were told, you fought hard and made a difference. Even when things brought you down, you never gave up and, it's, and have inspired me to do the same. When you think about it, almost every kid who goes to school would choose to stay home if given a choice. But then there are the children who can't go to school. They would give anything just for a simple education. They would give everything to know how to read, write, and count. This shows just how much we take for granted. Thank you for inspiring me and teaching me these lessons. I'm on Allegro Robotics team. The research project this year is hydrodynamics. Since we're an all-girl team, we decided to study women in third world countries. During our research, we saw how women are usually responsible for collecting water. This includes a six mile or more trip to a well. Here they will collect contaminated water and take it back to their villages. They will not walk another six miles back. Now they spend the whole day's time so cannot attend school. Not to mention they are drinking dirty water and will soon become very ill. All of this will result in a never-ending poverty cycle. This gave me a more personal connection to your book and your experience. Your book showed me how incredibly lucky and fortunate I am. This book showed me a new way of life. You showed me the girls really can change the world. Thank you. Gabrielle Hess attends Roan County High School and she won honorable mention in level three. Her book, Dreamland by Sarah Dessen. Dear Sarah Dessen, sometimes we feel like no one understands us. After suffering a tragedy, we tend to believe that our pain and our hurt is indescribable. The reiteration of, I'm so sorry, and it'll get better, just stirs up the pain in our hearts because we believe that no matter how much we're told that it will get better, it really won't. To us, the ones hurt by the loss or the pain, those words seem to mean as little as a crack in the pavement. They're there, but they don't push us forward or stop us from wanting to destroy ourselves. How could someone possibly empathize with the pain we hold in our heart? I thought that a lot. The day that I got the message that I had lost him, my whole world crumbled around me. Everything had been shattered. I had loved him so much and held him so dearly to my heart, I didn't think that he could ever slip away. We held a bond that was indescribable. I was in actual physical pain, and I wanted nothing more than to disappear along with him. You always hear about tragedies like car wrecks claiming the lives of families and friends, but you never realize that it could happen to someone you love. That gut-wrenching, heart-stopping feeling, I got when I saw the message ached. It was as if I, too, had my own life taken away, only instead it thrust me into my own little hell in my mind. Before that incident, I was obsessed with reading. It was impossible for my parents to get me to put down a book, and I took them everywhere with me. I read thousands of stories. There was something so beautiful in getting lost in pages and pages of fairy tales and high school romance. I put myself in the main character's shoes, and it was as if I was then sucked into the world. Then the incident with Ricky happened. A few months before I got the news, we had lost everything due to a horrendous flood that took our house and almost our lives. The only thing that seemed to calm down the swarming thoughts in my head was reading. The PTSD was hard to get over, but when I read, I was no longer having flashbacks or anxiousness whenever it stormed. I picked up as many books as I could. I even had to resort to online books as we couldn't get to a library and had run out of things to read. And with that, I was able to escape it all. 
I remember being curled up on a little inflatable mattress on our papa's living room floor in my own little world with a book. I'd stay up all night letting myself get t carried away in the stories, escaping my troubles and trading them in for dragons and dangerous daredevils. I was addicted to reading. However, no long after that was when I got the news. I was so dispirited that reading and writing was now a chore for me. I tried. I still picked up books or a pen, but nothing came to me. I was stuck reading the same paragraph again and again, the constant repetition droning on just like my life had and has seemed to. I would write a good portion of a page only to scrap it and wait for more inspiration. Everything I wrote just seemed too dull. All I wanted to do was sleep just to see him in my dreams. As unhealthy as it was, I wanted nothing more than to see his face and hear his voice, even if that meant sleeping my life away and creating my own escape. My life, became, my life came to a halt for more than a year. Eventually, I started to try and read again, but I was unable to find that same escape. I let myself drag on through the same monotonous motions in the hopes that maybe somewhere down the road I started to piece myself back together again. I started to get better, but I still wasn't me. I wanted nothing more than to disappear. When I first saw Dreamland, I was expecting the same thing. All of your books are wonderful, but I figured it'd be hard to attach myself to these characters. I was wrong. In fact, with every turn of the page, I found myself getting more and more attached. I was finally finding myself, and it was as if the book itself was pulling all of my broken parts back together. It brought comfort back to me when I didn't think it was possible. The book seemed to speak to me, whispering sweetly, you're not alone and suddenly I could breathe again. After the flood and losing Ricky, I felt entirely alone. I wanted to make myself better without any help. I wanted to be strong and independent. So I started pushing others away, and in their place, I filled the void with self-harm. I settled to do what others wanted in an attempt to please them in the hopes that I would gain my own gratification from their prizes. I started falling deeper and deeper into the hole, until suicide was on my mind daily. It was like a sweet lie in my ear saying that I'd be better off that way, but I wanted it all to end. I feel like Caitlin and I are similar in those ways. While her sister didn't die, she had to run away, and then that in itself is hard to deal with, as if she had disappeared just like my Ricky did. She filled herself with sorrow and turned to whatever she could find to get over her sister leaving. Like me, she wanted to be strong, refusing help from others and pushing them away. However, she couldn't do it all on her own. Reading this book helped me realize that I couldn't either. Asking for help doesn't make me weak. In fact, it takes a lot of bravery to do so. I decided to stand up and push through the pain. The quote, All I could think about was that girl, torn into tiny fragments with nothing to do but sit and wait to be made whole again, seemed to be speaking right to me. I was that girl, sitting there, and waiting to finally be myself again, to be put back together. Thank you for giving me a new perspective and helping me finally find myself. Your stories give girls like me the voice to speak out and the bravery to push past any obstacle, even if we do need help along the way. We'll hear more from award-winning Letters About Literature students when we come back. Letters About Literature is sponsored nationally by the Library of Congress and is supported financially by the Dollar General Literacy Foundation, the West Virginia Humanities Council, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, and the WBLC. Harley Johns attends the Lindsley School in Wheeling, and she is the top honor winner for Level 2. As a top honor recipient, Marley, along with Paisley Tabor in Level 1 and Kayla Strickland in Level 3, will compete at the Letters About Literature National Competition in Washington, D.C. Marley's book is The Devil's Arithmetic by Jane Yolen. Dear Jane Yolen, When I was about 10 or 11, I loved to read. I particularly enjoyed reading historical fiction novels because there was something so fascinating to me about how authors could use real history and create an intriguing, amazing story. Then when I was in sixth grade, I had the honor of having an amazing math teacher. 
a close friend and I asked her math teacher for some good book recommendations, and she told us that she loved The Devil's Arithmetic. I went to the library with my friend, and we each got a copy of the book. Back in sixth grade, I would read a book for fun, or just to read a good story. It wasn't until I went to the Holocaust Museum this November and realized that your book made me understand the tragedy of the Holocaust with a deeper perspective. While I was reading your book, of course I got sad and thought about the Holocaust, but I didn't really connect. I had a bad habit of reading things, just to memorize facts, rather than reading to understand emotion and connect with the characters. The story was great, and I overall enjoyed the book, but I just thought of it as another book about the Holocaust. It's key to remember that I read your book two years ago. In the past year and a half, in my English class, I began to learn how to really understand and experience books in a new way. I learned how to annotate and find the deeper meaning of stories, as well as how to understand how characters feel. Before that, I didn't really think of characters in a book as real people with real life experiences, vulnerability, and emotion. So, when the main character in your book, Hannah Stern, went into history and experienced what concentration camps were like, I just looked at it like a regular story about the Holocaust a topic that everybody knows about and is taught about multiple times, that the facts started to become superfluous. In some ways, it almost seemed like the Holocaust was dehumanized. Then, in November, my class took a trip to Washington, D.C., and on our second day of the trip, we visited the Holocaust Museum. I expected this visit to be pessimistic, so I tried my best to prepare myself and not show too much emotion. You should also know that I'm the kind of person who really takes their time in places like museums, so I read every single piece of information that I could at the Holocaust Museum. At the beginning of this experience, my habit of reading to learn facts came back, but then I told myself to put myself in these people's shoes and try to understand how they felt. While I was walking through the museum, your book came back to me. I couldn't remember the title of the book, but I remembered the plot and the events that Hannah went through, and in this museum, I began to really understand what it was like for these people, and the awful things that they had to endure. When I read your book, I don't really think that I was that I grasped the horrendous reality of what was happening. But when I saw real images of the Holocaust and read about it more, I truly began to understand how Hannah felt, along with the 17 million people who died in the Holocaust, six million of them being Jews. Of course, it is still a challenge to grasp that shocking number of deaths, because it is because it is simply impossible to imagine 17 million individuals with a separate personality, every human with their with their own unique traits, names, and hobbies. But I'm proud to say that now, I can imagine it so much better. Everybody involved in the Holocaust had a family or someone they loved. Can you imagine if not only your family, but everybody in your neighborhood was taken away and killed? Everyone you knew growing up, your friends, your barber, your grocer, the person you waved to when you walked down the street? I couldn't for a long time. When I remembered how Hannah felt while I was at the museum, I tried to imagine how I would feel. And that's when I could connect with all the other pictures of people, the stories, and the memories that were presented to me. For the first time, I could envision a character from a book as a real person, and that changed me. I have your book to thank for that. Finally, I wanted to thank you for writing such a great novel that I'm sure has had the same impact on me that many other people had. If I wouldn't have read this book as leisure reading, I don't think that I would have had the same experience at the Holocaust Museum that I did. Instead, I would have just read everything without any emotion, preventing myself from actually learning on a new level that I'd never experienced before. Just like every history teacher says, history happens so that we can prevent what happened in the past, and now I understand. If people like you didn't write novels about the Holocaust, if history teachers didn't tell you all the awful things that have happened in the world, if people don't try to understand and learn about the world's past, every human would be ignorant and creating the same problems that have already happened we would never learn from our mistakes. I hope that after such an awful event, everyone knows the importance of learning about history and tries to connect with the stories as I did, even if it takes some time, or in my case, two years. Sincerely, Marley Johns. Our final reader on today's program, notable mention recipient for level two, Alexis Spurlock of Huntington St. Joseph Catholic School and her book, Almost Home by Joan Bauer. Joe and Bauer, Footsteps, the thing we hear and feel when the person we love is walking out on us. This book, Almost Home, carries a lot of meaning when it comes to a home. Strength, love, passion, loyalty, and unity. This book put these words and turned them into something so much more than something you pull out of a dictionary. 
While reading your book, I found myself having a personal connection with sugar, us both having these issues with our father and not knowing if we'll be able to call our home home again. The wisdom and strength she was born with, and then as time went on, gained more, encouraged me, believing that everything can become better. This story wasn't written with a once upon a time beginning. It came with the hard hit of reality, which was something that grasped me into the story so quickly. During the story, I felt myself allowing me to go into the pages and be a part of the story myself. I created myself as this phantom girl, Sugar, and tried to see a perspective point. The strong-willed girl that has been through so much, but still managed to come back on top. She didn't allow those tears every day in the shower to make more cracks in the brokenness that was herself. She kept herself together, even though she thought she would fall to nothing at any moment. We all have those days when we fall to our knees, when something hurts so bad and you just fall to the ground because it feels like the weight of the world is falling onto you. Sugar never let those days stop her from becoming her dream. She kept going until she was able to say she got to the finish line. I know that some footsteps we hear becoming distant can be a good thing. We should allow the people that toxicate our lives walk away. Yes, it's hard to let those people go who should want to stay, but we have to do what is best for us. Allowing the people who hold you from reaching your goals are the ones that drown us. When you finally let go, you don't surrender, you win. In the end, you will show those people how amazing you turned out to be. Going back to the word home. Home isn't always a place, it's also a person. That is the most important thing that I've learned from this book. We don't need a place to be home. All you need is to be with that person or people. That you don't need to be, sorry, that you don't need a place to be happy or to be fulfilled. We need the people that we love and the people that need us. When you find those people or that person, that is when you truly know that you are home. I know that now. That I don't need my material objects. I need the people who love, support, care, and appreciate me. Thank you for that. I now take appreciation into everything and everyone. You help me see who my people are. You did that for me. And for that, I am truly grateful. Wholeheartedly, Alexis Spurlock. Letters About Literature is a program that highlights the reading and writing abilities of some of West Virginia's most gifted young students, like the ones we heard today. Thanks to all of the students for taking part in this wonderful program. We'll have more on Libraries Today right after this. Since the very first Letters About Literature contest in 1994, thousands of West Virginia students have taken the time to read books and write about what those books have meant to them. As you heard from our student writers on this show, their letters can be very poignant and heartfelt. Letters About Literature students understand how reading a book is more than just another class assignment. It can be a life-changing experience. I'd like to thank the students who read their books for us today and explain to us how important a book can be. I'm your host, Stan Al. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Libraries Today.